If you didn't think television could hurt you, watch out. In half an hour, Spencer's latest murder investigation leads him to a corrupt evangelist. But now, by contrast, there's an angelic touch in Film 90 with Barry Norman. sad evening actually because this is the last edition of film 90 an announcement that will certainly cause much beating of breasts gnashing of teeth loud wailing and all round national mourning but please control yourselves for still to come after christmas is my special films of the year program without which the festive season would never be complete what though can i offer you in the meantime well in a year in which america is celebrating the season of goodwill by opening godfather 3 on christmas day how about an interview with Rocky, dear old Sly Stallone and his little lad Sage? That's coming up in a minute or two. And so are previews of some of the films that will be opening in the next couple of weeks. But for openers, let's have a look at Almost an Angel, which stars Mr and Mrs Paul Hogan, she being otherwise known as Linda Kozlowski. This, however, does not concern itself with the further adventures of Crocodile Dundee. Instead, Hogan plays a burglar who's convinced that he's died and come back to Earth as an angel. Essentially what happens is that while saving a small boy from being run over, Hogan is himself badly injured and lying semi-conscious in hospital believes that he's gone to heaven, where God, heavily disguised as Charlton Heston, presumably to give himself some credibility, calls him a scumbag, but nevertheless gives him a second chance by sending him back to earth as a probationary angel. Do you know about angels? I don't mean the ones with the uh, long white dresses and the wings. I mean like angels of mercy. And the ones that come back to Earth to do good deeds and stuff. You've been visited by one of those angels, right? Nah. I'm not supposed to tell you this, but as you know about angels, I guess it's okay. Well, almost. I'm on probation. I'm bulletproof, but I can't fly yet. God didn't choose you. To save the world from evil politicians, did he? No. Oh. Well, no, to, to help the needy and to give instead of taking. Same as your caper, right? Right. So, deeply affected by his unnerving encounter with Charlton God, the recovered Hogan goes about morbidly being nice to the needy. Is he really an angel? Who knows? But at least he shows that much good can be done through faith, blind self-confidence and a crooked genius for electronics. Eventually, he befriends wheelchair-bound Elias Cotius and his sister, Linda Kozlowski, and using his well-established technological know-how, creates a number of apparent miracles to help them raise money to save the recreation centre they run for children in danger of going to the bad. Come on, Steve. You met him in a bar. Anytime your friends from the city visit, they're perfectly welcome to stay here. Ma, we're not talking about some old buddy from high school. Yeah, you're right, sis. I have so many old buddies dropping by lately, I've, I've just lost track. What can I say? That's not the point, Steve. It's just not like you, and it's not right to bring home a complete stranger in the middle of the night like that. 
Terry's not just some drifter, bros. I mean, the guy's got, he's got money. He lives in L.A. He's got a house in L.A., a big house. He's just on vacation. I saw him reading the Bible earlier. Anyone who starts the day with a good book can't be too far off the track. An axe murderer can read. Hello? Just in time. Sit down, Terry. Thank you. Gotta feed the body. Well as the soul. One me, Mrs. Garner. So, you have family living in L.A., Mr. Dean? No, uh... Not living. They're all dead. I'm sorry. I killed them with an axe. <laughs> <laughs> well, all this is very whimsical and amusing and moral, and in a low-key way, rather fetching. And given the current popularity of films about life after death, it's certainly topical. Yet somehow, it's not as effective or entertaining as it might have been. Paul Hogan, far from being a scumbag, is very likeable as, well, come to think of it, a sort of criminal crocodile dundee. And so is Elias Cotius, though he'd be a lot more likeable when he stops trying to pass himself off as a young Robert De Niro. But Paul Hogan's script is not quite good enough, and John Cornell's direction, which shows very little sense of comic timing, is not nearly good enough. The film's OK, but it might have been a lot better than that. Almost an Angel opens on Boxing Day, not exactly traditional Christmas fare perhaps, but at least less bloodthirsty entertainment than Godfather 3 across the Atlantic. But now for the last time this year, here's the list of the top ten films in London. At ten, The Comfort of Strangers. Not much comfort, but plenty of strangeness in Paul Schrader's shocker. Nine, Presumed Innocent, Harrison Ford as the prosecutor prosecuted in a strong courtroom drama. Eight, Goodfellas, Ray Liotta and Robert De Niro at their most vicious in Martin Scorsese's stylish mafia saga. Seven is Flatliners, heart-stopping adventures for Kiefer Sutherland and Julia Roberts when they go beyond the grave. And six, Henry and June, The Miller's Tale, a literary love triangle in 1930s Paris. At five, Metropolitan, adolescent angst on the Manhattan Deb scene in a Christmas cracker of the film. Four Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the real Michelangelo and co are undoubtedly spinning in their graves. Three Ghost, Paramount's Paranormal Parable, knocked off the top slot but still packing them in. At two, The Sheltering Sky, John Malkovich and Deborah Winger, plenty of camels in Bertolucci's erotic epic. Number one, Home Alone, straight to the top for John Hughes' yuletide yarn of juvenile Christmas chaos. Well, now, Air America is the sort of film that shows Hollywood's essential lack of bottle. It had every opportunity to be a tough, exciting and controversial expose of America's political duplicity and the cynical corruption of the CIA. Instead, it chose to be a jokey buddy picture, the buddies being Mel Gibson and Robert Downey Jr. They play a couple of pilots for Air America, a dummy airline set up by the CIA in Laos in 1969, a time when honest President Nixon was stoutly denying any American military involvement in that country. Gibson, of course, is the laconic, sardonic, hard-bitten old pro, Downey the still idealistic young Tyro. Gibson, like the other jaded pilots, accepts that the airline's main function is to run heroin with the CIA's blessing for General Bert Kwok, the Laotian military commander, who then sells it to organised crime in New York to raise money for his army. This is a strong, fascinating tale, but for the most part it's lost in a morass of subplots involving a bumbling US senator, Lane Smith, the refugee camp run by Nancy Travis, Gibson's private gun-running scam, and the drunken horseplay of the pilots. You're redlining! Yeah. Jane, watch your controls! You're redlining! Yeah. Thank you, huh? I thought you had this helicopter blessed oh, this morning. I, I did. I, 
I had a feeling the monk wasn't concentrating that well. There's no two ways about it, you know? We gotta drop. No, man. Yeah, we gotta drop with sniper bait. Well, what's the procedure? Who goes first? Well, there's not really any hard and fast rules about crashing straight through a cockpit. Why don't you go first? No, I don't want to go first. Okay, okay, I'll go first. No, I don't want to go second. All right. Okay, we'll toss the coin. Call. Tails. Yeah, is that heads? Tails. What is that? Tails. It's heads, isn't it? That's tails. I'll go and look, okay? Soft. I hate coming second. Well, that fall seemed to go pretty well, all things considered. Anyway, much is touched upon, nothing is explored in any depth. Every time things begin to look serious and therefore interesting, the film gets the wind up and lurches off into larky goings-on and buddy-buddy bonding. Some of the action scenes are pretty good, but it's sad to see a director like Roger Spottiswood, who once made an excellent political thriller in Under Fire, lending himself to as half-hearted, indeed timid, a movie as this. Air America opens on January the 4th. Right now, though, let's cheer ourselves up with a little movie news. Six hours of uncut film from Marilyn Monroe's last unfinished movie, Something's Got to Give, have been found in a Kansas salt mine. One way to preserve it, I suppose. Contrary to stories that she was out of control and off the wall, in her last months it seems she looks pretty good in it. It's that time of year again. What, Christmas? Oh yes, that of course, but far more important, in Hollywood, it's the opening of the Oscar stakes. Front runner at the moment is Martin Scorsese's Goodfellas, which won the Los Angeles Film Critics Award for Best Picture and Best Director. But coming up strongly are Stephen Frears' The Grifters and Francis Coppola's long-awaited Godfather Part Three. In fact, the only movie with an outside chance that doesn't have a gangster in it is Kevin Costner's directorial debut, Dances with Wolves. Goodfellas would be my choice so far. Well, in arachnophobia, British entomologist Julian Sands is faffing about in Venezuela when he comes across these spider's webs that look as if they've been knitted out of Aran wool. Stone me, what kind of spiders are these? Well, of course, they're the very deadliest kind, a species hitherto unknown to anyone outside a Hollywood studio special effects department. Huge they are, hairy, lethal. They don't bother with flies, they eat rats, for heaven's sake. And thanks to Dr. Sand's carelessness, one of the nastiest of them, a real whopper, finds his way to a little Californian town where it goes forth and multiplies, much to the embarrassment of another doctor, Jeff Daniels, who's heavily blamed by the local residents for the multiplicity of corpses that are suddenly littering the place. So Bobby here, he's... Uh... He's the Broncos' star quarterback. Hi. Hi. I taught him to throw a football before he could walk. Hmm. I coached the team. Nepotism, huh? Actually, we're Baptists. Well, well nobody comes up to a mortician at a party and says, Hey, Herb, you think I might be dead? <laughs> Must drive you nuts trying to dip your Dorito while somebody's showing you his growth. <laughs> How do you handle it? Well, I just mentioned that until quite recently, my wife was a successful stockbroker. Uh, I say, uh, what do you think about that artificial intelligence? Why shouldn't I have another? Because you've had too much already. Let's no, go. I'm thirsty. That's the uh, man they said. Their, their son recently passed away. Oh, that's awful. How? I'm not sure. He, he was a scientist. A photographer. A photographer. Yeah, he was on a scientific expedition down in, in Venice, Venice, Venezuela. Venezuela. Nobody would tell me how. Or even let me see him to Come say on, goodbye. Let's go. Let's go. Why let's wouldn't anybody let me understand? Daniels, wouldn't you know, is a serious sufferer from arachnophobia or fear of spiders. And, of course, has to overcome this in the last reel to save his wife, Harley Jane Kozak, his family, the town, California, and civilization as we know it. 
Arachnophobia is the first feature film directed by Frank Marshall, a longtime sidekick of Steven Spielberg, and at times it's vaguely reminiscent of Jaws and Indiana Jones, as well as Hitchcock's The Birds. It's good scary fun, but fortunately not too scary even for a lifelong arachnophobe like me, who, while knowing that only 0.1% of spiders are actually dangerous to mankind, knows equally well that 100% of the little suckers send any sensible person screaming up the wall. The real stars of the picture, inevitably, are Incy Wincy and his numerous offspring, but the humans are pretty good too, especially John Goodman as the town's know-all slob of an insect exterminator. Uh, John. There's a rumor going around that some kind of spider might have killed Sam Metcalf, maybe Margaret, maybe even my Bronco. Doubtful, Henry. There was a case in Florida where one of my colleagues bumped into a nest of black widows. Sustained over a dozen bites and lived. Of course, he permanently lost control of all of his bodily functions. There's no spider here. But I will hunt down the alleged arachnid and spread some to kingdom come. Well, now, talking of slobs, as I was, reminds me quite naturally of Rocky. You know, Rocky Balboa, the Italian stallion, the white man's Mike Tyson. Well, he, impersonated as ever by Sylvester Stallone, is about to hit the screen for the fifth time and no doubt the canvas for the umpteenth time. Have you ever noticed that in boxing movies, the guy to bet on is the one who loses the first 11 rounds? Anyway, Rocky V introduces us to a juvenile Italian stallion, Sly's little lad, Sage Stallone. Tom Brook has been talking to both Sage and his dad. The new film finds the Italian stallion down, but not quite out. Back in Philadelphia with his family, living in the neighborhood where Rocky Balboa's adventures first began. Rocky has fallen on hard times. An untrustworthy accountant has left him virtually broke. On top of this, his last fight has caused irreparable damage to his brain. Doctors have warned Rocky that to take to the ring again could cost him his life. Sylvester Stallone says presenting Balboa as less invincible than in the more recent Rocky films adds to his appeal. When a character is on top, such as he was in 3 and 4, it's very hard to conjure up true grassroots, blue-collar, proletariat emotion. Because you say, hey, it's real tough to feel sorry for a guy with a Ferrari. Sorry, that's life. And uh, we are basically a, a world of underdogs. So I thought if I could get him back and show that through him symbolically that what is, what seems invincible today can be a pulper, an invalid tomorrow, just like that. And how fortune has turned so quickly, especially in this country lately. I thought this is very apropos to the mood of the country. I heard that at one point you wanted the Rocky character to die in Rocky mm. V and you were talked out of it, is that right? I, I had written a death scene. Um, I don't know if that's the way I want to... I want Rocky to end on some sense of optimism, that, that he doesn't have to die. Because he dies almost a spiritual death in this. I mean, he is taken to the lower depths. He's never been this low. And he manages to rise to a certain level, not the great heights at the end, almost to a level of normalcy. And I think that's the message that I want to give out. Because Rocky is unable to fight, he's taken on the role of training a young up-and-coming boxer called Tommy Gunn. But his protege ultimately turns against him, leaving Rocky devastated. And because he's devoted so much time working with the young boxer, he's also neglected his wife and son. So, in Rocky V, Balboa fights to reclaim his family, including his offspring, Rocky Jr., played by Stallone's real-life son. Hey, what do you want to say to me? Can't you like another person? You're the other person! You said I would be number one to you. You said that and you lied. You lied to me and you lied to Mom. That is very biographical, the relationship in there, because I was gone many, many, many years. It's funny how he acts out our relationship on screen, because there are moments when he's not acting. And I see, I know it. <laughs> that must have been a little disconcerting for you in a way, wasn't it? It is, but I was extremely proud that he was able to dig down and show that on, on film. Okay, so maybe I'll wise up someday too. Sage Stallone gives a remarkably convincing performance. Some critics thought he was better than his father. 
Sage got paternal support both when acting and when fielding questions with reporters. I think... Yes. <laughs> okay, yes. Sage looked like he was having a lot of fun on location, but he does admit to some jitters when the cameras first began to roll. I was nervous the first time. My father would come up to me and give me a lot of advice, and he'd say, Sage, you're doing good. Why don't you act natural? And I said, okay. And he's like, let it all come from your stomach. And he'd give me acting advice. In Rocky V, the machismo is toned down, but Balboa still clearly inhabits a man's world. But it's one that appeals to many women, as was evident when Stallone appeared at the Philadelphia Civic Center during filming. It's every Italian's dream to meet Sylvester Stallone. Are you kidding? I never professed him to be a sex symbol. I think that the women like Rocky in, in not the sense that they want to go to bed with him, per se, but they just uh, feel a simpatico for him, again, in a maternal fashion. Rocky V opened here last month, and it just doesn't seem to have the box office punch of the previous films. Perhaps it's because Rocky's go-for-it individualism has lost some of its appeal at a time when the national mood in America is rather gloomy. Anyway, Stallone is now taking a gamble, once again trying to move away from Rocky and Rambo roles. For the first time, he's making a comedy, playing a gangster in a film still in production called Oscar. It's so enjoyable. It really is wonderful. For the first time, I'm doing something where I say, ah... Now, finally, we're getting something close to my character, my, my odd perception on life, which is very satirical. One of Stallone's problems is that his action characters have become indelible trademarks. Audiences find it hard to accept him in other roles. Indeed, many think in real life, Stallone behaves just like Rocky or Rambo. No, 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 no. He's a normal person. He's just... He'll talk normal, he's not, yo. He's kind of, you know, just flat out, you know, deep voice, but not, not like, Ugh. In one way, it's flattering that you have become so at one with anything, uh, at least in a positive nature, like Rocky. But it's also frustrating to realize that it's a character, it's a performance. I don't do it like that, you know? It is something that's done. I mean, they're, they're, they're fun characters. John Rambo, I must, is not so much fun because he has some deep psychological problems that you, you carry home with you at night. But Bow Ball was great, was great. And I've gone as far as I can with the character and maintaining some level of integrity. But do you think in a way you'll go down in history as Rocky or Rambo? I think so. I mean, it all depends. If my career goes on the way I would like it to be, uh, they will diminish but never expire. No, far and away. When I do die, it will say Sylvester Stallone went down for the final count. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed for the interview. You seem much more intelligent in real life than you do as Rambo hey, or Rocky. Hey. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. You know, if old Sly gave acting advice to young Sage, who on earth gave it to Sly in the first place? And come to think of it, it's just as well, isn't it, that Mrs. Stallone didn't have twins. I don't think the world is ready yet for an identical pair of lads called Sage and Onion Stallone. However, Rocky V opens here on January 25th, preceded two weeks earlier by reversal of fortune, a riveting exploration of the Klaus von Bülow case. Von Bülow, played by Jeremy Irons, is, as you may recall, the aristocratic European who, in 1982, was found guilty of attempting to murder his super-rich American wife, Sonny, Glenn Close, by putting her into an insulin-induced coma from which she's never yet recovered. He appealed and hired a Harvard law professor, Alan Dershowitz, played by Ron Silver, to reverse the verdict. The story of what transpired is narrated in voiceover by Miss Close, who also appears from time to time in flashback. <laughs> I didn't mean to mention our understanding about my extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. I've been involved with someone who falls outside the parameters of our agreements. Really? Someone peripherally in our circle. Billy Bosky's daughter, Alexandra Hiles. Well.
That must be better for you than what you've had to put up with. You're referring to the call girls? Yes. I mean, that is where you've gone previously, isn't it? Yes, it is. And isn't this better? Or is Billy Botsky's daughter a call girl, too? This is much better. What unfolds is an absorbing study of the lifestyle of the very rich, as well as a drama of conflicting ideals and principles. The film, directed very confidently by Barbet Schroeder, is based on Alan Dershowitz's own book about the case. And what makes it intriguing is that while it tells you the legal outcome, von Bülow was eventually acquitted, it doesn't purport to know the truth of what happened. And in an event so shrouded in mystery, who could know the truth? From the start, there were basically two schools of thought. Either von Bülow injected the insulin, or Sunny did it herself in a suicide attempt. Dershowitz himself was by no means sure that von Bülow was innocent, but took the case anyway because he suspected the man had been legally railroaded. Okay, look, I said I didn't want to hear your story, but I do need some information. Of course. Okay, I gather that the older children denied Sonny had a problem with pills and alcohol? Spectacular understatement. So there must be somebody who saw it, right? Some witness, somebody somewhere, a friend. You want affidavits? Yes, I do. I'll get them. You'll get them. You should also know that the drugs prescribed for me were taken by Sonny. It's a lot of drugs, class. But the prosecution's allegation that I knew about syringes injections, totally accurate. Sonny and I used to give ourselves B12 injections in the late 60s. It was quite a fad in London. Can I explain something to you? The less I know from you, the more options I have. When you tell me the truth, you limit me to a defense that lines up with what you have to say. But isn't the truth the simplest way, Alan? I mean, why did I stay all day at Sonny's side without calling a doctor? Because Sonny detested doctors. If we called one without her approval, she went berserk. Once she broke her hip and didn't go to hospital for two full days. Klaus, did you hear what I just said? Of course. Did you hear the judge sentence me? Sorry. I, 30 years is a pretty stiff sentence. Twice trying to murder one's wife, anything less would be monstrous. But for a man like myself, who did nothing, What I wanted to ask, if we lose the appeal, uh, will I have the chance later to set my affairs in order before I'm incarcerated? In Europe, a gentleman is given the opportunity to end things properly. Come on, Klaus. We are each the keeper of our own souls, Alan. The contrast between lawyer and client makes for splendid cinema. The fastidious von Bülow, coldly aloof, far too haughty ever to play for sympathy, contemptuously amused by the public's general dislike of him and faintly anti-Semitic. Dershowitz, tough, emotional Jewish, a streetwise graduate of Brooklyn who recruits his brightest students, including an old girlfriend, Arabella Shora, to work with him on the case. The two men have absolutely nothing in common except their determination to overturn the verdict of the original jury. It's the very contrast and often the conflict between them that makes the film work so well. Glenn Close has surprisingly little to do, but does it impressively, while both Ron Silver and Jeremy Irons are first-rate. Irons, in particular, giving, I think, the most polished and memorable performance of his career so far. And that's just about that. Though I'm sure you'd like to know that my chat earlier this year with Steven Spielberg will be repeated this Friday night as a sort of curtain raiser to the showing of E.T. on Christmas Day. And on December the 29th, I'll be back with my review of 1990, including my pick of the best films of the year. But now, before I leave you with a clip from Fantasia, may I just express the wish that Santa Claus will see fit to replace the bunch of imposters currently masquerading down under as an England cricket team with some real players and may I also wish you all a very happy and international politics permitting a very peaceful Christmas. Goodbye.
The cinema theme continues in a couple of minutes on BBC Two. The Late Show reports on how the Holocaust has been portrayed on the big screen and includes interviews with directors Marcel Ophuls, Louis Malle and Costa Gavras. Christmas Day on BBC One at five past three ET. It's a man from outer space and we're taking him to a spaceship. Then at ten past five, Christmas only fools and horses. So I caught mad cow disease. Who the hell is going to notice? At six twenty-five, fun and games in Bruce Forsyth's Christmas Generation game. <laughs> Christmas bread at seven thirty. I wish you'd get rid of that silly belly bag. You look like a kangaroo. <laughs> and birds of a feather at eight twenty. Blimey, is that is Cooper. <laughs> 9.45, Diane Keaton inherits a daughter in Baby Boo. You don't stick this bottle back in your mouth this very second. You're going to find yourself on the next Greyhound to Duluth. Do you understand? Christmas Day on BBC One. Now, to complete this Tuesday night on BBC One, there's murder in the air. And the man who's called in to investigate is Spencer. <laughs> 